Hi everyone, we've got a couple of more seconds before we're going to kick off the Connected Vehicle Masterclass. Um, so just give us a couple of seconds, uh, we're just waiting for 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And it's 2 p.m. Eastern Time! <laughs> um, so welcome everyone. Uh, today is actually a really exciting uh, part of our Masterclass series. We've you know, we did one with um, school zones, we've done another one with uh, intersection devices, and today we're doing one on connected vehicles with Brian Mulligan. So I want to welcome Brian Mulligan here. Thanks, Peter. And um, I think, Jessica, you've got a couple of uh, things that you wanted to just talk about. Yeah, so per usual, we have some handouts um, in your dashboard there if you want to download that are going to pertain to what Brian and Peter are going to be talking about today. And if you would like um, to submit some questions, if you just want to use the chat box in your GoToMeeting dashboard right there, and we will um, find some time throughout the masterclass today to answer those. Great. Thanks very much, Jessica. So, you know, connected vehicles. Um, Everybody's heard of this term connected vehicles and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Can you just take us through what is connected vehicles? Well, that's a very good point uh, and I could spend uh, the best part of half an hour just talking about uh, what is connected vehicles, but I'm going to split it into, into two categories in my, in my answer. The first one, connected vehicles, is the business of the cars and the infrastructure and the pedestrians and so forth, all having radios that can talk to each other to transmit messages. And so at a level, people talk about connected vehicles in terms of what kinds of radios and things like that. And yes, we're going to talk about a fair amount of that today. Uh, but what we're going to try and more talk about is the applications and the benefits. And that's a part that actually isn't uh, articulated enough, which is, so what's it going to do for you? And that's where uh, we're going to have some practical demonstrations and some, a lot of practical talk about how connected vehicles gets paramedics to citizens in need more quickly by getting them more safely through the traffic. Uh, a great um, application uh, emerged just the other day of potentially making it safer for police officers to do pursuit um, of criminals and how one uh, does that with connected vehicles. The fact that all the vehicles are going to talk to all the other vehicles allows them to deliver safety applications and quite bluntly not run into each other. And so there's some huge safety benefits um, to make it, the roads really safer for uh, the vehicles of today, the autonomous vehicles of tomorrow, and the pedestrian, cyclists, scooters, and all the new modes of applications, uh, including transit and things like that. So, as I like to say, when everything's connected to everything, it changes everything, and uh, all sorts of applications are possible. And that would be the real focus, I think, to talk about is the benefits to a city to equip their infrastructure with this connected vehicle technology so they can be ready to deliver these applications for their citizens today. So, you know, one of the things you, you talked about there was the safety side of it. Uh, what does that mean in terms of, in other words, I mean, is this, is this going to stop all accidents? Is this going, what is it going to do? Well, the, the, the safety application, there's the short and the, the long answer. The sort of the medium length answer goes like this, um, is that, uh, current automobiles, um, or many of them, or all of them, and it's coming as compulsory in the future, are equipped with automatic emergency braking. So the what we call the collision imminent uh, safety applications are going to be handled by sensors on the vehicle. But what you want to do is you want to know that around the corner on the freeway, there's a queue of vehicles stopped ahead. And so what you want to do is eliminate or substantially reduce rear-end collisions on the freeway. Now, that's an, an application for connected vehicles um, in that that will prevent your vehicle from running into the stop vehicle that's ahead. And that will just rear-end collisions on the, on the interstate 
and, and on the arterial streets causes a significant amount of congestion and so not only it's going to save people's lives but it's going to reduce congestion uh, and make more predictable travel times and so those are the kinds of applications and but that's just one of maybe 30 that I could talk about for connected vehicles um, where having the vehicle connected to the other vehicles as well as to the infrastructure are just going to make the vehicles fundamentally safer and, and help solve these approximately 40,000 uh, deaths that we get and, and millions of injuries that we get on, on the roads every year. Now it's going to make the vehicle safer but it's also going to make the infrastructure safer. That is, that is correct. And so the infrastructure comes into play in, in a number of different ways. Um, and this goes from uh, people running red lights. Red light running is a significant cause of accidents in the infrastructure. People are just distracted. People are just uh, inattentive. People are reckless. People are impaired. And uh, what, uh, you know, the, this... This, this connected vehicle technology does, it allows essentially at an application level two additional layers of safety. Now, you know, I've been driving for, for many years and I've been interacting with the infrastructure only with my eyes. So I drive around with two cameras and a computer and um, process the red lights. And if I make a mistake, bad things happen. Now, what Connected Vehicles does in, in the first instance, it provides an additional layer of safety, and we'll see some examples of this with a little video that we shot just before we went on, on air. Uh, what, that what you're going to see is that your car is going to go bop, bop, red light, if there's a red light that your car thinks you're going to run. So that's a layer of safety where you drive, interacting with the infrastructure, not only with your eyes, but with your ears. So now it's like two people driving the car. We all know from this, you know, safety analysis that having two people drive do a thing. That's why you have a pilot and a co-pilot because you have when you have two people uh, working on this thing, it's better. Now the third layer of safety is not only does it do all of that, but should the car brake by itself and not run the red light? And so that's a decision for the automaker to do and for the person that he's sold that they've sold the car to so that's the third layer of safety of connected vehicles when the car actually behaves differently and actually does some automatic emergency braking based on the car knowing that there's a red light ahead uh, from being connected to it um, by radio so what this whole connected vehicle side is going to do in, the, in our traffic industry is provide the means of connecting the car to the traffic signal, to the school zone, to all the infrastructure that it can actually communicate and, and make smart decisions. Correct, and, and, that, and that's in three categories. So uh, all of these are available just by having connected vehicles. And so the first one is the safety applications. The, the safety applications don't run a red light, don't speed in a school zone. The number of people who don't mean to speed in a school zone, but they're just distracted when they drive past the school zone. So for example, in California, uh, I like the signs that say uh, speed limit 25 miles an hour when children are present. And, uh, you know, I often wonder, is, well, that how many children? Well, what about just short people and so forth? But, but once you connect it electronically uh, with this environment, then the car knows that this is the time when the children go on and off the bus and the buses are leaving and there's fewer accidents and the accidents that there are are less severe when the traffic is going slower when the time of the children coming in and out of the school so that's there's a number of applications in the realm of safety the second is in the realm of convenience and that is um, uh, there are a number of applications that uh, are, are available and, and, and being talked about and demonstrated. Uh, an interesting killer application that's just emerged is what we call get ready for green. That everybody's distracted and you all know how irritating it is when you're standing at a traffic light and there's somebody in front of you, the light in front of you uh, turns green and the person doesn't go. Interestingly enough, that um, 
is uh, a, a, a cause of wasted time at the intersection. And those three or four seconds that are wasted when somebody doesn't go are just wasted forever. That's inefficiency to the startup delay that's built into the traffic network. And if we um, do these convenience applications, we can do the third thing, which is efficiency improvements. And efficiency improvements uh, include things like making sure everybody goes when the light turns green. It in involves making transit work better in accordance with the local authorities' public policy. How aggressively do they want transport to work better? But, the, but it's, a, it's a real potential um, game changer if we can uh, persuade people to ride transit or in general multi-use uh, vehicles, multi-passenger vehicles, because then if you do that by making the transit work better, then fewer people drive cars and, and so forth. And, um, and so what you can do is then potentially make a, a, a big reduction in traffic. In fact, we all know what, what happens uh, if you reduce the, the traffic on the roads, because that's what we're experiencing right now in, uh, throughout the United States with the COVID-19 uh, shutdowns that we're experiencing. And we all see uh, what, what the traffic would be like if we took some of the vehicles off the road, and that is substantially better. So, uh, so, so those are the three categories. There's safety applications, there's convenience applications, making it easier to drive, and, the, and then the efficiency applications, which will make traffic work better. That's the promise of connected vehicles. That's absolutely amazing. Um, now, I'm looking into the screen ahead of me and seeing all of the different things on the back wall over here. We haven't actually explained you know, where we are, uh, you know, what are we doing in this lab that we're in, and, and it's called the IATL. Can you, can you talk us through what the IATL is and, and why it was created? Sure. And so, as a technology company and as an entrepreneur, um, and as you can see from my gray hair, uh, you know, somewhat approaching the end of my career, not too soon, I dearly hope, uh, that, that it's time to think about A, giving back, B, the role of the private sector in delivering a better future uh, for transportation. For my children. For your children and my grandchildren. <laughs> so, so what we realized, you know, we've been, I've been in the technology business a long time and an entrepreneur for a long time. And um, for a substantial portion of that time, figured out that what we should do is transportation is run by the government, whether that's the state government, the federal government, the local government, it's run by some government. And what we should just do is wait and decide what they want to do. And then try and sell them whatever it is that they come up with. But we realized that actually, and the, 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 the internet and the cell phone re revolution, the smartphone revolution, changed that, where what it is, it's actually, there's a responsibility for us in the private sector, in the technology space. And I like to call it the, 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 it's the great Wayne Gretzky story, is that you don't try and uh, skate towards where the puck is. You skate towards where the puck is going to be. And in the technology space, that what that means is, yes, we've got to uh, sell a product that people want to buy today. And in connected vehicles, there are a number of these products. We'll talk about them uh, in due course. But we want to develop our technologies and our access to market and, 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 and our applications for where the puck is going to be. And we're going to talk about radios. And we talk about future proof. And we're going to talk about how we're going to deliver an infrastructure which can deliver these promises uh, that I talked about earlier, but they're going to deliver it in an environment where the specifications for the radios change every 18 months. And so what we're going to do is make it possible to buy these technologies and buy, and not only ourselves, this, this is where the world is headed. And so what we're doing is not trying to persuade anybody to buy this before for no good reason. We're trying to say that this is where the technologies are going to be. And so what you do is you future-proof your infrastructure by following a couple of these simple principles. Um, did, did that answer your... Well, yes, it did. But, but 
what is what is the IATL? Right. What? what you see, I'm, I'm getting old. I forgot your question. What, what is it that we hear? What, what is, why, did, why did you create the IATL? Right. So what we realized is that as the private sector was creating this, uh, the, the, these technologies, there's such a disconnect between the auto manufacturers, the technology companies, the local authorities, that they're all talking past each other for the last 20 years with trying to get this technology deployed. And so what they all need to do is to come to a place where all the infrastructure, all the different kinds of infrastructure are all present. And what you'll see as we walk around this room in a little bit is that um, uh, every kind of traffic controller that's used in the United States is present here so that we can all test these radios and these technologies and these protocols and these applications, most importantly, so that we know they're going to work in practice. So the idea is, of the IATL is to bridge what we call getting out of the science experiment, getting out of the lab into the street. So the ITL is, is, is centered here in Alpharetta, Georgia, where we've actually got a hundred and some square miles of uh, of streets where all equipped with the technology, all equipped with the radios. And what the IATL was our contribution with others in the private sector uh, to say this is where everybody can come and test um, and experience the future at no charge. We're, we're collaborative, we're cooperative, and that's the goal of the ITL uh, is to make it easy for people to be successful uh, in connected vehicles. And, and that was what we, uh, we did. We set up a mainly, we're an infrastructure company. We mainly focused on the, on the infrastructure, but as you drive around, uh, and, and we'll show some of the video, that all the, the intersections around the IATL, all equipped with this technology and a variety of technologies where folks can come and make sure that this all works in practice. So, so the lab behind us, you know, I, I can see all these traffic controllers and we'll take everyone for a little walk around soon. But I can see all these different traffic controllers that allow someone to come and test their technology in a laboratory environment that has all the traffic controllers from all over the, uh, all over the country. And then also, once they've tested it here, go and play in the traffic. Correct. And so... Um, as we introduce new technologies, and the same applied to cell phones and the internet and Ethernet and all these technologies when they were first developed, is that you needed to have practical places where you could test and mature the technologies. So that's the phase that we're at. And we'll talk about the 5G AA, 5G Automotive Association, uh, and how it's brought together automakers, the cell phone companies. Uh, technology companies and infrastructure companies like ourselves. But we have to get to the point where we can actually see all this working in practice and our, our private and public sector partners here uh, were instrumental in us being able to stand up the Infrastructure Automotive Technology Laboratory. It's a play on ATL being Atlanta, but it's the Infrastructure Automotive Technology Laboratory. And just in its name, that's what it does. I think that's a great time for us to uh, jump up and maybe follow you around as maybe you take us on a bit of a tour of the lab and explain to us some of the technology that, that's available here. So just uh, bear with me as I go and uh, plug in some different microphones and grab a camera uh, as, and then we're going to walk around. So it might get a little bit wobbly, but uh, forgive me for that. All right. right. You want to take us to the um, to the to the side of everywhere, and we'll, we'll, you, you can walk us through everything. Right. I, I think we'll, we'll we'll start up here, um, and this is the training area. So we use this as a training uh, space to equip it with different kinds of tables and uh, things. Uh, Jessica, is this is this working for you? Can you hear me satisfactorily if I talk like this? Yes. Nice and clear. All right. Thanks. And so. Uh, 
normal kind of training area. But interestingly enough, that what you'll see by this green up here, this is the uh, all the traffic lights in this laboratory uh, in Alpharetta, Georgia, and this whole of this North Atlanta area is is equipped with various ways, but well, various types of technology. And this shows managing the status and health of a connected vehicle system. So these kinds of systems where uh, everything is brought back uh, into a browser and to emails and alerts and alarms and, and text messages and so forth to tell you what the status is. And the other thing that you'll see on the screen is you'll see a bunch of fire trucks. Now, one of the things that Alpha edited in is that they're, uh, this is the, the fire truck over here. These are all the fire trucks that are live in in Alfred, and these blue lines are where they've traveled in the last hour. Uh, on uh, and the blue lines means that the, these were what we call idle uh, calls or idle, idle trips where they did not have lights and sirens. When they have put the lights and sirens on, connected vehicle technology turns the lights green for them uh, and also you know tra tracks the data of how many lights they went through and what the response times were and so forth, giving what's called a day one application for connected vehicles. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit more. So this is the training area. Down, down here, there are a number of offices and lockup areas and conference rooms and so forth. Uh, some of them are used by, by our staff. Some of them are used by visitors who want to maintain confidentiality. They can have a lockup room and so forth where they can test their, their equipment. Um, key part of getting these uh, technologies out in the streets is what we call socializing the technology. Key part of socializing technology is to be able to do social events. And this is this area here where we put presentations and so forth uh, up, up, on the, up on the screen and uh, gives you a place to be able to host events uh, to engage the what we call the politicians in the press. Politicians in the press are instrumental in being able to get uh, used as a, tra as a traffic engineer we're running the traffic department to be engaged the politicians in the press, and this is where we do some of that kind of work. This over here is the technology part of the laboratory, and uh, what we're going to do is have a walk around uh, and see the various kinds of things that, that, that we do. And so one of the things we do, you can see them at the end there, is the uh, school beacons, and that is the business of, of um, slowing the, uh, the traffic down when the school beacon is, is on. And so these are programmed by time of day and so forth, but they also need to be able to communicate with the cars. So they're also a connected vehicle device that needs to be able to communicate uh, with the vehicle so that you can alert the driver or introduce a limiter to slow the car down when it's in an active school zone. I obviously turn something on uh, manually. But these are different kinds of school beacons. Some are solar powered and some are um, AC. Uh, you get, well, as we walk down here, we'll see things and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, in fact, I won't rush through. Jim Peter can uh, zoom in on some of the. Yeah, so you'll actually see over here that, that they are various different pods. So, for instance, this is pod number three, which is a railroad warning beacon. And, um, you know, that it's another type of connected vehicle application that we're doing. But each one of these is a station here. So you've got pod one, pod two, and it allows people to test and see how everything's working and everything's set up beforehand. So it's not like someone's gonna come into the lab and figure out, plug this wire in here, that wire in there. Everything's configured that they can test what a school beacon running on AC power works like and what a railroad warning beacon message would be to their vehicle. So you've got all of this different technology in one lab that allows people to come and test out and actually experience what all of this is. So we, we can have a look down here, as we're passing this on the, on the left here. This is, this top part over here, is typically what goes into a, a fire truck, it goes into a bus, it goes into a police vehicle, and this is the, what's called the onboard unit, that causes the lights to go green, 
uh, and everybody else safely brought to a halt using connected vehicle technology. Why I'm holding the, the switches at the bottom, they just simulate the, the wires that are connected in the fire track. So, for example, the left and right indicators, the door switches, uh, and so forth. But this is a test station to be able to test connected vehicles, and these are the antenna pointing out, uh, out, out the window. These on the wall here are all kinds of different uh, devices. Um, whether they're school beacons, these are um, slow down as zones that are often used or traffic calming zones that are often used by local authorities in high accident areas. That's the kind of thing, the information you actually want to get into the vehicle so that you know as a driver if you're in a high accident area and you're going too fast. So it's an additional layer of safety over and above the, uh, uh, the, 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 the displays on the street. Railroad, railroad crossings is uh, another great connected vehicle application, not really thought, thought about very much, but um, at grade rail crossings where you've got a train coming over, you want to tell everybody a long way away that the train's there and you want to reroute people around that at grade rail crossings, as well as the safety application of, of, of stopping people when there's a train present. These are other um, devices of, of various types, including some new kinds of technologies uh, to resolve the problem of unprotected left turn, flooding pedestrian uh, crossings and pedestrian safety systems that you can see here that it's uh, an RRFB. This is an enhanced RRFB that includes a, a uh, dynamic message sign, all to do with the business of keeping it safe for pedestrian crossings the road. Then alerting the car when there's a pedestrian in the crossing. These are the kind of application, safety applications that build one on top of each other to be able to keep the pedestrians and the vulnerable road users safe. Uh, traffic intersections, there are probably 20 different kinds of traffic intersections in a, just in Atlanta here. Um, they, the, the variety of traffic intersections is, is quite staggering. And this is a place in which we drive around, you'll see them all in practice, where you can test all the different kinds of traffic intersections, because the car is going to have to understand how uh, all these different kinds of traffic intersections work. Um, we're coming up here. There's pedestrian crossings, um, intelligent flashing yellow arrow, uh, which is what we call our unprotected left turn uh, technology, which uh, we're collaborating with uh, some early adopter cities uh, for MUTCD experimental uh, licenses to put this out in the, in the street. What you see in the next part is DSRC, uh, radios and so we as a technology company we've dealt with a number of different brands of DSRC radios, cellular VTX direct radios and so forth um, and so this is a place where we, where we can provide interoperability testing at an application level. Do all these things work in practice and so uh, this is what uh, what you're uh, what you're seeing here. Uh, at the end we'll see some video cameras Hey, this is this is a funny looking controller here, Brian. What's this? All right, well there you go. This is actually a 170 controller. This is you know the original original controller that uh, does uh, programmed in assembler and it's got a hex into a keypad and there's still a remarkable number of these uh, in use around the country. So how do we make this into a connected vehicle device? So what's we do is we provide technologies that can actually listen, quote unquote, to the uh, the greens of the intersection, and you know, based on uh, learning, it can learn because it knows what the yellow interval is. So if it's not uh, when it go, goes green, then after it's gone green, it'll go yellow for an interval, and after it goes uh, yellow, it will go red uh, until it goes back to green. And so from picking up the intervals, we can actually learn the progression, which doesn't give you, it gives you perfect status so that we can deliver the um, red light running perfectly. 
but the uh, some of the timers, the, the the get ready for green and so forth, uh, it works pretty well. And but you can give a high probability of knowing when the light is going to turn green because you know which interval is 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 coming next. So this is a way of, of us bringing along the legacy infrastructure of all different types with all different drivers to make the infrastructure ready for this connected vehicle future. All right, now this this aisle I think is the one that everybody, when they think of connected vehicles and traffic signals and all the rest is most familiar with. Right, so what you'll hear is uh, you see a lot of different kinds of traffic controllers and these are just the traffic controllers that we've worked with over the years. And these all support signal phase and timing and experiences they all support signal phase and timing slightly differently. And so this is where you can resolve uh, any kinds of errors and protocols and, and particularly if you're an auto company and you're saying, well, I wonder what's, what, what, you know, we've got to have this problem in, in Phoenix, Arizona. We'll say, okay, well, come along here to part 12. That's the traffic controller that's in Phoenix, Arizona. And we actually had that, uh, just that situation occur. Uh, we're busy doing a connected vehicle project in on the island, uh, one of the islands in Hawaii. And the folks came there to test out some stuff. And these are the traffic controllers on the right-hand side here that were applicable in Hawaii. And uh, that saved everybody a trip to, to Hawaii to go and do some testing and showed that we could, uh, how effective this lab was in actually simulating conditions around the corner, around the, the, the world. This is Tuscaloosa so in, in Alabama, for example. Explain to me, I, I see this traffic signal controller, Siemens controller, and then there's a box under it. Right. Well, what is that box? So this box in, uh, is, applied, is applied information technology. That's what we actually sell as uh, the, in connected vehicle terms, of what's called a roadside unit processor an RSU processor, and that provides the intelligence to do a lot of things, both maintaining the sta status and health of the connected vehicle system, and also providing some preemption rules, as well as providing some fault-finding interface, as well as providing overall status and health of the cabinet. So, for example, this is where uh, this will connect, and even if your fiber goes down or your, uh, your power fails to your cabinet, uh, this device, which has its own little internal battery, will phone home and give you an email or a text message to say, hey, the power has failed at this location. So uh, this, this is a key, key part of the connected vehicle technology, an RSU processor, which uh, is a key, just part of the, the architecture of uh, delivering this future-proof uh, connected vehicle infrastructure. And one of the things I do want to mention there is um, th there was a masterclass that was done two, a week ago just on that device. So for anyone in the audience that wants to learn a little bit more about, you know, because that, that device, there's a whole bunch of other applications as well, video streaming and, and pasture connectivity. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, you can jump on to uh, one of the previous webinars as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Peter. I think that one of the things that, that I'd like to just emphasize uh, that in this uh, explaining this connected vehicle masterclass, we're explaining our vision of connected vehicles. We're explaining our vision of where the world is going to be in a couple of years' times and the key things that a city or a jurisdiction or a county needs to take on board to make sure that their infrastructure is future proof. Whether you buy from us or, or, or somebody else, uh, doesn't matter in the context of what's most important is that you don't deploy technology which is becomes obsolete as soon as you put it up the pole. That doesn't do anybody any good. It gives the whole industry a bad name. It makes it all seem complicated. So I'm going to really err on the side of just explaining not all the technical detail that goes on behind the scenes. I think Peter and, uh, and Chris and some of the other guys will do that uh, in, in due course. But I'm going to focus on the high level stuff how do you maintain the status and health of a connected vehicle infrastructure? How do you deploy infrastructure that's future-proof? How do you deploy it with a wide variety of traffic controllers and traffic cabinets and so forth? 
uh, and so that you can be confident that you've invested your uh, money in delivering applications on day one that's future-proof for your citizens in year 20. So that's uh, that's what I talk about, not selling what we have, but but skating towards where the cut, where the pack is going to be, where the future is going to be. And, and and further down here, we've just got more and more devices connected up of all the different places in the cities. But you standing here at this other station now, um, you know what what is shown over here? Okay, so th these are just different brands of what's called onboard units, OBUs. This is a DSRC OBU. This is a Cellular Vita X Direct OBU. This is a Cellular Vita to Network OBU. It's called a phone. It's called a smartphone. And so the business of showing here that um, all these things are connected, uh, and, and this um, the device there in, in, in turn uh, is connected to a traffic light that's up the street here. And up at the top of the street that you can see this traffic light is red, and uh, it'll give you uh, connectivity through the through the uh, through just the radios which we we use every day, which is the cellular network radios. And we, then you can compare how well that works compared with the other radios, or it's for long range and so forth. There's a there's a number of applications for each radio. And so while I'm going to talk about Cellular V2X Direct, I'm going to talk about DSRC, I'm going to talk about network radios, I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi radios, I'm going to talk about 5G radios. All of these are all radios that send messages, and provided they all send the same message, then you actually don't have to worry too much about what kind of radio it is, because they all send the same messages, and then you can focus on the applications, and I'll talk in a while about how we make it future-proof with pluggable radios, that are upgradable without a bucket track so that you can be assured of always having the radios you need no matter where the technology goes in the future so let me just take it back a step because we've talked about a lot of different things here and we've seen a lot of different uh devices here i mean you've got traffic signal controllers from all of these different manufacturers here and what you're saying is in this lab it allows us and anybody else to make sure that the connected vehicle equipment will work with all these different types of traffic signal controllers because you alluded earlier before some of them work differently to others what, what do you mean by that what I'm talking about is still a philosophical issue it's called the past the present and the future and those get all blurred together with people trying to scare you about the future People try and say, ah, but in but your past, your existing traffic controllers don't support it. So therefore, there was a, uh, a discussion in the connected vehicles about what you needed is you needed to rip out all your tra traffic controllers and put in new traffic controllers to make connected vehicles work. You need to rip out your communications and it would only work if you had fiber. All of these stories just proved not to be true in practice. So you've got the past, what's happened in the past, you've got the present, how your city is currently set up, and the future, which is where this is all going to end up. And what we as a technology company, we just pride ourselves that we've got to take care of you. Now, yes, we can go down into the, all the detail about the, how we do that and how we do over there software updates and how we do security and so, so forth. And that's all important at the right time when you come to actually make a, a purchasing decision. But the concept is, is that you need a set of technologies and you need a technology company that does the past, the present and the future. And I, and I did that from, uh, uh, from a, a 170 controller, which uh, uh, you know, people wouldn't believe it does connected vehicles actually quite well, right through to the ATC controllers, right to future traffic controllers, future communications, video, future radios, 5G, and all of that. So I heard you talk about over the air software updates. Why does a city actually need over the air software updates? What's the reason for it? The reason, I'm gonna answer that in two ways. Uh, I'm gonna give you the first, the sort of the technical reason, and then I'm going to give you the practical reason. The technical reason is that 
for any city that's an early adopter city that wants to start delivering applications to their citizens on the first day. Let's say they want to make the buses work better. Let's say they want to make uh, the paramedics work better. They can deploy the infrastructure in confidence because as new applications come about, over their software update will automatically put those applications into your infrastructure. Let's say there's a small change in the standards at some time in the future. You don't have to agonize about that because that can be fixed with an over there software update. So it's both for bug fixes as well as applications in the future. Over there software update gives you the capability, provided it's secure, and we're going to talk about security uh, a little bit later, um, will give you the capability of making your environment future-proof. So that's sort of the more technical reason. The practical reason is that Microsoft, Steve Jobs at Apple, and Google showed us that that's how the world works. And all of our phones and our smartphones and our smart wireless devices do over-the-air software updates, where they do new applications, they do bug fixes, they do security fixes, and it's just the way the world works now. So this is just part of bringing your infrastructure into the, the, the next century, is to be able to, is to ensure that every component in your, in your world can do over there software updates. And we're no different in that regard. So we support over there software updates um, remotely to, to all the devices that are in your city. So that means no one needs to actually drive out to their traffic devices and plug a computer in. They can just do that over there. That is correct. And so what that means is that it does, does have a thing. It saves your call outs. The business of, of what we call glance information at a glance, the health is managing, managing and monitoring the, the status of, and health, means that you're alerted when something goes wrong. That we at the back end managing all these um, systems are also alerted when something goes wrong. So let's say we've you know got school beacons in the city of Marietta. I'm just going to use some Georgia, Georgia examples. And oh my word, we find a bug. Well, you in the city of Alpharetta would benefit from that knowledge because what we do is then when we fix the bug in Alpharetta, in Marietta, we do an over there software update, but we also push it out to Alpharetta and our other school beacon users. And so this is the way that everybody benefits from the experiences of everybody else. It's not only with bugs, but we've had a lot of feature requests. And uh, what we do is we develop, continually improve the product by developing new features. When we've got new features and we test them in the lab, then we roll them out into our early adopter cities, and when everybody's happy with them, then they're available to go out to all our other customers. And that's the way, just the same way as your smartphone works, everybody benefits from the experience of everybody else. That's the key to over there software updates. You want to continue taking us through the, through the lab? Sure, sure. I think what I'll do is I'll touch more specifically on connected vehicles and some of the radio technologies and some of the lessons that we learned. And again, as we say, skating towards where the puck is going to be. A lot of the early adopter uh, connected vehicle radios involve getting a bucket truck and putting the radio at the top of the pole. We heard loud and clear from our channel partners and our cities so that's a problem, that if you want to put technology into the intersection, put it in a cabinet, put it in a cabinet, don't put it at the top of the pole, where you can only maintain it with a bucket truck. And, and so this has led to this design, this is what we call our 95 multi-use, it's called dual active, dual, uh, dual mode, dual active radio. And so there's a small cabinet at the bottom of the pole, with some uh, GPS there, Antenna and so forth. And the antenna, which are dumb devices with no intelligence, they go at the top of the pole. And if you drive around Alpharetta and various other places in Hawaii and, and in Texas, you'll see all this technology in use in the street. And what that allows you to do is to do two key things. First of all, you can maintain the technology without using a bucket truck. Now, when you've got wide boulevards and there's a place where you can pull your uh, 
your, your bucket truck off to the side of the road, that might not seem like uh, such an issue. But when you're in a congested area, when you're on surface streets, and the only way you can do maintain your connected vehicle infrastructure is with a lane closure, that's where it becomes much more difficult to maintain um, your equipment because it involves inconveniencing people in order to do maintenance. So what we do is that we listen to the customers and this goes on the bottom of the, the pole, the antenna goes at the top of the pole, and that's now in, in what wide deployment for ease of maintenance. But it does two other things. One is connects in the same way, uh, either through your fiber or through the cell network. The, the backhaul communication doesn't matter. And so it does over the air software update. So as the technologies change, as the specifications might change, for example, um, uh, there's coming up a major change to the security standards standards on which all the pilot uh, systems were built and how they did credential management um, is all changing with the new standards which in the wisdom of whoever has been decided not to be backwards compatible but that's a crisis for people who, do, who, who, who have to then go out to the device to plug in a laptop to be able to do maintenance and so or of, of the software. Over there, software update means that we can accommodate both the new and the old standards uh, and deliver a secure environment without doing a field trip. Those are just the, the, the some of the examples. The other key things that it does is it supports multiple radios. Now I'm going to just illustrate multiple radios with some functional art that we've got on the on the wall here. Um, and this is you know for this is the device that you see in this cabinet, it's just butterflied open to make it, uh, you know, look, and so you can see Peter in the, uh, the reflection. But nonetheless, what you see is multiple radios in here. And you'll see that these slots are radios, a DSRC radio. This is a cellular V2X direct radio. This is a Wi Fi radio. We equip all our devices with Wi Fi radios um, in the unlicensed band. Uh, because historically that was the way the radio that was available to us, but it's also a radio that can be used for connected vehicle applications, even in vent of the spectrum going away, the safety spectrum going away. Now there's a number of applications that we use this radio for. The fourth slot over here is what we call the 5G slot. And you can see that this is where we're getting ready for future radios. You can put a 4G radio in there, you can put a 5G radio in there and, and so forth, because all of these slots include all the radios, and these are module makers. This is the way the radio works. This thing that's roughly an inch or an inch and a half square is a radio module. And uh, while we make these, uh, we make them based on uh, suppliers of the radios who all getting ready for 5G. And the potential is that the 5G radio is the game changer which allows you to accomplish both direct as well as uh, network radios with one radio. And people say, well, what are we going to do about that? And we're going to say, well, we're going to plug it in over there. What you do, you don't need a bucket truck. You don't need to change anything. You don't need to take anything down or do anything, put anything up. You just come along and plug in a new radio. To illustrate the kind of things that, uh, <laughs> that just in the last, probably seven years these are all the radios we've experienced so far and uh, this again is a little piece of functional art just to show the uh, what we call the evolution of radios and, and, it, and it, when, when smartphones started they started with 2g radios and then 3g radios was the latest you'd only buy a smartphone if it had 3g radio these are wi-fi radios which came up in, in parallel and there's been a number of technologies um, I'm not sure, I'm sure some people will remember. Well, what about Nextel? Whatever happened to Nextel? Nextel was a Wi Fi radio. And they bet their technology on the fact that uh, push to talk and WiMAX and these kinds of radios would conquer the world. Well, as it happens, they didn't bet right for various reasons. They ended up being bought by Sprint. But next, and now push to tell, uh, push to talk, and and Wi-Fi radios aren't available 
for you as a consumer, but they are available uh, for us in the industrial space uh, using various frequencies. Um, and so the business is not to sell you on this radio versus that radio and so forth, but to show that these radios are actually all quite small and all inconsequential in terms of cost to just plan for a future where you can have all the radios. In that case, you don't have to decide who's going to win and who's going to lose like Nextel did, for example, or had to do. Because what they did is they lost out to what's called 4G LTE. And LTE stands for long-term evolution. So this is a waveform that allows 4G and 5G and many different kinds of frequencies to all coexist. And so this is, practical terms, is the current state of the art for deployment quite widely. But And so uh, lots of devices have, you know, have this radio as standard. Uh, but some of them, for example, uh, in, in parts of uh, rural America, might still only ha have better coverage on 3G. So we allow and, and provide for, um, included as part of the service for these upgrades. And we've turned up some cities from 2G, from 2G to 3G and 3G to 4G, and now we're preparing for 5G. These are two other radios <coughs> that you see, which is uh, called the Cellular Vito X Direct. Uh, which is uh, um, the so-called PC5 interface. It has a couple of names, but this is a line of sight radio, similar in many respects to DSRC. DSRC is a Wi-Fi direct based direct radio. They're just based on competing technologies, and, and, and some will tell the advantages of one, and some will tell the advantages of the other. And indeed, the world seems to be moving to cellular V2X direct. Um, I'm not going to get into the business of selling you that one's better than the other. You can research that in various ways. But the most important thing is the Ford Motor Company that sells 10% of America's motor vehicles have announced that in 2022, uh, they're going to support this radio. So that's good enough reason why your infrastructure better support this radio. The costs of supporting this radio are not significant once you've got this, this direct radio. And so one may as well do that, then one's completely future-proofed. As it happens, the FCC uh, is going through the process of allocating spectrum uh, to, to, the, to this radio, and that um, is going to be resolved in the next couple of months, and that seems the most likely path. But again, what you're hearing me say, is don't bet on choosing one radio versus the other radio. Focus on the applications that your citizens need and how those applications get delivered and how you're part of this, this future wave so that you can deploy your infrastructure now and enjoy the benefits now in the confidence, and I could say, hashtag get ready for Ford, by the time Ford rolls off your, uh, the dealer's parking lot in your, in your city, they'll talk to all your traffic intersections. That's the promise of, of what we're doing here. And then finally, uh, the 5G, the future over here, is uh, these are the standards that folks are working on right now, which include all sorts of applications of high bandwidth, low latency, of edge computing. There are many technologies, which I can take you through at whatever level of detail, but they also include some direct technologies called 5G NR, 5G new radio, which is like cellular V2X direct on steroids. And it's all built into the same silicon which is going to reduce the costs. So there'll be one module that will support direct radio as well as network radio, as well as edge computing radio. Uh, and, and that's the future. That's probably two years away. And your chances are, well, okay, let me not do anything for two years. Fine, you can make that decision. But then when you come to do, deploy this 5G NR, because now it's finally uh, sorted out, stable, available, and modules. Well, over here, we'll expand this piece of art because now we've got 6G and the, the implications of what's coming next. So if you wait for the radius, for this rapidly changing technology world, if you wait for it to be stable, if you wait for it to be finished, it'll never be finished. And that was the, one of the big problems of focusing so heavily in the past 
on radios and this radio versus that radio, it's much easier to persuade somebody not to do something than to give the confidence to proceed with confidence to deploy infrastructure and the confidence you're going to support all the radios and future radios which haven't been invented yet. So the design that, that you've come up with, you know, just looking at, at this little functional artwork over here, allows people to stay with the future and upgrade and, and, and you know, it gives them sort of peace of mind? Correct. It's all to do with protecting the investment. And so, and again, the, the, that not only applies to our customers, it applies to us as well. What happens if we bet on a technology? Uh, I'm going to pick on poor old Nextel, because for those of you uh, that have been in the business for perhaps more than 10 years, they'll know who Nextel and their push to the tech technology work. The whole company bet that, uh, that, that, that Wi-Fi radios would win out. And for whatever reason, they didn't. There's another great example, which is Iridium, who put up a constellation of low Earth orbit satellites uh, in competition to, um, to, to cell phones. When they started, they were the only game in town. They were satellite radios, and uh, it was a multi-billion dollar uh, program by Motorola that nearly bankrupted Motorola. Uh, and at that time, Nobody thought it was, it was inconceivable that you could cover the world in cell phone towers. I mean, who would have thought that such a thing would have been possible? And a lot of people didn't, and a lot of people bet against it, but it proved, just in the same way, nobody would believe that Google would photograph every street in the world, and they did. Well, the same were applied to Iridium, and cell phones took over. And so I'm not in the business of betting one technology versus the other technology. I'll talk about what advantages might be of one versus the other. But in principle, we as a company are adopting the approach. We don't care, provided you send the messages over all the radios that are in use. Let's focus on the applications. Let's focus on saving lives. Let's focus on delivering value, saving lives, convenience applications and the efficiencies that are part parcel of connected vehicles. And let's start doing it today. So Brian, one of the things you did talk about, you know, we've done a really great walkthrough through the lab. I really appreciate that. Uh, very informative, but there's another part to this lab, which is outside. The most important part is, as I like to say, let's go and play in the traffic, uh, because this isn't a science experiment that we're trying to solve. This is an engineering problem with real lives, real traffic. And we've got to be able to get out in the traffic. And what I say, you know, do what your mother always told you not to do, which is go and play in the traffic. And what we'll see uh, before we uh, uh, started this, this presentation, we had a driver around here in operator and shot some video of uh, what was happening out in the street. Peter's just connecting up the, uh, the mics and so forth. And so it's just a seven minute video of a, a drive through some certain streets showing you what some of the applications might look like of connected vehicles. And again, obviously as you're driving around, you have no idea what's uh, what you're going to come across. Okay. Uh, Jessica, can you hear me if I talk like this? Yes, I can. Looks great. All right. Thanks. So, so interestingly enough, this is taking off outside the parking lot in the IATL and going driving up in this in the street. Now, these intersections all support multiple radios. Uh, they support DSRC, they support Cellular V2X, and then they Cellular V2X Direct, and they support Cellular V2X Network. What we just did is showed the applications running on a smartphone. You've got, you've got a user interface, and you've got a way of connecting to the speakers of the car. And so 
this is actually quite an interesting light because for the traffic engineers, uh, it rests in walk on this cross street. So every time you pitch up at this light, you get a 120 second countdown. And what you'll see is the, <coughs> is the countdown happening of uh, over many seconds it's got there. And, and the key thing with this as well is obviously we hear, you know, this is a live drive. So this is showing you what a real world situation actually is where someone does have to wait for 120 seconds before the traffic signal changes. And the interesting thing is how much more relaxing it is because you know you're not frustrated. Now, how do you want to display? This is just one user interface. We call it a bridging technology. It's called Travel Safely. It's available as part of this connected vehicle solution at no charge. It's free for the public to download and experience connected vehicles today. And what it does is, it, you know, as you get used to using it, it's much less frustrating and much less tiring because you're not watching the light con with such energy. So what you'll see is that it's getting nearly ready to change. Get ready for green. And the car tells you that the light is going to change green. Now, once you get used to that, I just that's a convenience application which is just very powerful in practice that everybody gets used to it and he has a, a light coming up that's got a through arrow and a lift and this is where the car thought that I was going to run the red light and so again those are the kinds of things that's a safety application that it's for, for the car manufacturer to decide, well, how aggressively do I want that to go off? How, uh, this, this is quite an interesting intersection because it has a flashing yellow arrow. And this is an interesting, what should an autonomous vehicle do with a flashing yellow arrow? What should a semi-autonomous vehicle do with a flashing yellow, yellow arrow? And so all of these different real life configurations, you know, here again is a, is a, uh, red through and a re re and a, a red left. I deliberately was driving a little bit aggressively, so I got some alerts. So you could see how. Get ready for green. Let me pay attention, and and go. Again, when you're having your conversation with your passenger in the in the vehicle, it's just really convenient. I mean, I've driven through these intersections. And intersections like this, we, we've got hundreds of them. And that's a visual indicator of what's happening. But majority of the time, people are actually using the app in the background for alerts. That, that's correct. So in other words, even if you had this phone in your pocket, um, uh, it, it would still go off. Even if you're running Waze or some other application. Here's an interesting thing. We're in a school zone here. And what I did is I accelerated. Speeding in school zone to illustrate that how you can use these connected vehicle technologies for school zones. So it's much more than just an academic exercise only applicable to uh, traffic intersections, but to school zones and all sorts of other pedestrian applications and so forth, cyclists, vulnerable road users. Uh, we've done about 30 or more applications and this is just illustrating uh, a couple. This is another intersection on a side street here uh, where um, the intersection rests in walk, and you're going to wait for two minutes every time you drive around this the, the, this particular circuit. We know we know that it is, and this is where you can actually uh, uh, you know understand that the light's not going to change. You're not for the full two minutes scanning it for every millisecond. Is it going to change? Yeah, and that's kind of I mean these are always frustrating intersections, but. I find them less frustrating when when you know that it's going to take another minute or longer, this one, two minutes before it's going to change. So, you know, this is the real world situation right now that the, you know, a lot of people in the public, well, that traffic light took five minutes. Okay, that's probably an exaggeration, but it feels like five minutes when you don't know. This one certainly takes two and a half. And interestingly <laughs> enough, and interestingly enough, uh, all these traffic controllers all support signal phase and timing in different ways. And you'll see them actually with the odd error that comes up. 
And this is the business of getting these out of the lab into the practice, into the real world, where you can start seeing these errors and correcting them to mature this technology so that it all, that it all works. Um, and that's a key part of the lab and this and the city that we have here and, and other cities uh, are around here and across the nation, where we're collaborating widely. Uh, with universities and uh, to give a shout out to Dr. Alex Hainan at the uh, University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. He's got the whole city of Tuscaloosa as part of his test bed uh, and so forth. And so um, a lot, uh, the University of Hawaii is, is standing up a system in Hawaii. And again, with the business of not just doing radios, but also doing applications. Here's an example of actually the timer's jump uh, and uh, just changes to green unexpectedly. Green. And we, but we still give a, an alert to say green, the lights changed uh, to green. Off, off you go, prevent you from staring at your phone. I know everybody on this call uh, wouldn't check texts while they were uh, in the traffic. Here's an interesting thing, which is called the round the corner problem. And so you can see there's a red light around the corner and nobody knows. This is a great application for connected vehicles because an autonomous vehicle or an autonomous shuttle wouldn't know that there was a red light around the corner. And so that's called the around the corner over the hill problem. And uh, it's a great application for for connected vehicles. I love the way that it's just connecting one intersection, next intersection, the next intersection. Yes, it knows what's coming. And it, and, and it thinks it's only you think it's only connected to the intersection that's ahead of you. Well, that actually isn't true. It's connected to all the intersections that are around you. Here's another one with a flashing yellow arrow, uh, red light. Get ready for green. Get ready for green. Off we go. That one, we didn't have to wait uh, long for. We just had to wait a minute for. We well, waited a few seconds for. And so, again, the applications are connected to all the intersections that are around you but it knows from your direction and what's called the map file for each of these uh, intersections it knows which section intersection you're approaching and from which direction you're approaching and what phase of the traffic controller that is uh, is coming ahead is a green through and a red left turn now you, you're about to start um, driving back into the IATL now you know, the, you, you talked about uh, other applications as well, like school zones. And... By, by the way, you just see in the in the yeah, this is the IATL, the laboratory, the building uh, that that we're physically sitting in right now. Pete, you want to just take the uh... yeah. So we're going to go turn the video back on. Uh, I'll have, I'll have a drink of water while all that's going on. All right, Jessica, you can see us again? Yep. Perfect, perfect. Uh, well, you almost have to take a break there because it feels like I was just in the car running around. Um, yes, and I, and I think um, what you can see how much happens in just in seven minutes. And we can go on and on with all sorts of different applications and put a cyclist out there and shows what happens when you connect to a cyclist and a pedestrian and pedestrian crossings and so forth. Um, it really, uh, uh, there's there's a rich suite of applications that are available for connected vehicles that are over and above the radios. So you can have the whole discussion about the radios, but you need to focus on the applications. What are we going to do with this to save lives and improve the traffic? So you're talking about applications, but you know everybody talks about all these weird and wonderful things that connected vehicles can do in the future. But what are the, you know, can you explain what are some of the day one applications that people can do right now today versus some of the stuff that, that's exciting that could be in the future. But, you know, when we deploy this type of stuff, we, we want to deploy it and actually have some applications now. That's a hugely important point, which I'm going to answer not at a technical level, 
but at a business level. And we've been through a number of these examples in the in, in in the past one is why should anybody ever buy a cell phone when there are no cell towers why should anybody ever put up a cell tower when there are no cell phones and that go, now that goes to the business of day one applications so if i came to to you as mr joe Pavic said I, I want you to buy this smartphone it's made by apple it costs a thousand dollars and in two years time trust me this is going to do a lot of neat things. It's just going to be very difficult to make a sale. So that's the power and the importance of day one applications. The day one applications that, that I see, for example, are the business of um, getting paramedics to citizens in need. Now I'm going to jump around all over the place because Peter's busy uh, changing the, the camera a little bit. I'll just let him finish here. Everybody close your eyes, we're going to make you seasick. Sorry, excuse me everyone, the technical difficulties of the camera actually starting to shake there. Apologize about that. Ah, that's good. So the day one applications. Get paramedics to citizens in need more quickly and safely. So using the same technology to turn the lights green for your paramedics, uh, we show in our regional cities here that on average a paramedic passes through a traffic, five traffic intersections on an active call. We save between 10 and 15 seconds at a traffic light by turning the light green, being, turning, making it, bringing everybody else safely to a halt, solving the problem of uh, the, the median, which are often now built up and you can't get into the opposing lanes on a response. Um, so we save a minute on average or more of paramedics getting to citizens. There's some great research. I'm sure Peter and uh, the team can, can, can point it to you if you're interested that saving life, saving time in getting paramedics to citizens in need significantly increases the 365 day survivability of heart attack, stroke and accident victims. And Interestingly enough, uh, came to light the other day of opioid victims. We've got an opioid epi epidemic where it's time critical to inject the folks with the uh, Narcam antidote. And uh, so the, the cities are motivating the purchase of connected vehicle equipment by uh, using the use case of getting paramedics to citizens in need. Uh, the next use case is to make the buses work better. The business of giving transit signal priority to buses uh, based on time of day, based on um, public policy. Some folks want to always give the bus priority. Some folks, we've implemented uh, local rules where you, you, you give the bus priority if the bus is behind schedule and there are more than five people on the bus. So you can implement whatever public policy uh, your local authority wants to do. And all of that is with the same connected vehicle application. What you saw is a um, what we call a bridging application of travel safely. Uh, some cities are uh, very motivated to include their public in their connected vehicle demonstrations. And this is a, an easy way of doing it by having the same connected vehicle messages uh, go to people's smartphones, uh, pedestrians and cyclists and scooters and so forth. Uh, and so those are all day one applications that you can achieve today where you can demonstrate, and we've done this a number of times, stand up at your council meeting and stand up in front of your public and say, we bought something that saves lives of our citizens today, that helps our citizens today. And then we're getting ready for Ford, getting ready for all the business opportunities, getting ready for 5G, getting ready to engage the mobile network operators. So we're both ready for the present as well as ready for the future. And that and that's actually a key thing. You said getting ready for the future. And you talked about it a little bit earlier when you were standing over there was we don't know what applications are going to come up in the future. 
So the ability of having this over-the-air software update included in the equipment allows you to prepare for things that we haven't thought about today. Absolutely correct. And we can illustrate that with a number of different examples uh, and why it's so important. I've talked about the radio and how it's important to have your radios future-proof because we've said when everything's connected to everything it changes everything so we've talked about uh, the aspect of the radios and the advent of 5g and getting ready for these different kinds of, of radios which we know are coming we know we're deploying an environment of change we've got over there software updates which allow you to fix problems and deliver applications but the other thing that we don't know is what does our new social world look like? And one of the things is that we are either frightened by or encouraged by the pace of change. We're not a political company, man. We just develop technology. But we want to make um, this future accessible in the way that we as Americans decide we want it to be. And I'm going to illustrate with a couple of examples. Some of these, again, might be embracing. If you, if you think this is a good idea, it might be frightening if you think that this is a bad idea. But I'll give you these, these examples. One of the things is, what is the priority of uh, transit vehicles? Now, what we're used to is the transit vehicles are going to be um, you know, large 60-seater buses, and that's fine. We're either going to give them a lane or we're not going to give them land or we're going to give them priority or not going to give them priority. But what should it look like if the whole of the transit business moves to 10-seater local buses? And you'll say, well, that's impossible. Nobody would ever do that. And I say, well, you just have to look around the rest of the world. And from accent, you can tell I'm originally South African. 20 years ago, but that's how the, the, the transit business works in South Africa. That's unrouted, unscheduled, 10-seater buses driving everywhere. What should our public policy be about giving those folks a priority at the lights? That's the same concept with scooters. Same concept with scooters. One day, there were none, and then scooters fell out of the sky, and then in various places, they're gone again. Should they have their own lane? Should they have their own phase at the traffic lights? All of these are to be decided in the future. There's another uh, topic that's being discussed about is should freight vehicles have priority in off-peak periods? So, in fact, it was, uh, I, I did a radio show called Travel Safety, and I uh, had Rebecca Brewster, the uh, CEO of the Tracking Research Institute, uh, on a recent show. And you can see the interviews on our YouTube channel. But she talked about the congestion costs to the trucking industry of peak congestion. And it ended up being $75, million, $75 billion. So that I did the math and it calculated at $234 for every man, woman, and child in America. We take, if, if we're a couple, we take. 500 bucks in nice 25 crisp green $20 notes and we tear them up. Every one of us because that's built into the price of delivery. So there's, there's and this would be done on a regional basis, should we give freight vehicles priority? Should we charge them for that? Should we toll surface streets so that rich people can pay for convenience? I don't have a dog in this fight. But mm. high occupancy tolls and convenience tolling is part of the fabric of our society. And connected vehicles support all of these things. Yeah. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but, but certainly in the future, we as society will face all of these things head on and decide what kind of world we want to live in, what we want to do about social equity, um, the response time, and the, uh, the, the health outcomes for underprivileged folks or poor folks 
is just worse than for rich folks. And one of the reasons is rich folks have motor cars to drive themselves to hospital in the event of emergency. The business of servicing those areas by improving the response time uh, for paramedics is something that cities, inner cities, are, are looking at as a social equity equation. And it's not for me to say whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. That's the political arena. But we as technology guys and as connected vehicle guys, we're responsible and accountable for delivering out that promise, whatever the politicians and the society demand. And that's what we focused on is with all our techniques is skating towards where we think the pack is going to be, where the pack is going to be, is delivering outcomes that society demands in the next immediate period. And I'll leave you with one frightening thought on that uh, thing, is that we, I think we all pretty much agree that the pace of change is frightening. But the cautionary tale is this. The pace of change that it is now is the slowest it's going to be for the rest of our lives. So the pace of change is accelerating. And that's a frightening or brilliant view is that we're going to be at the centerpiece in this technology world of skating towards a pack that's accelerating in all sorts of unpredictable directions. And that's where we as a technology company focus on delivering those solutions where the pack is going to be. Okay, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, all these different connected vehicle technologies, but, you know, what, what do the car or the auto manufacturers think about all of this connected vehicle technology? Well, that's, again, is quite an interesting point because for a hundred years, there's been a, a social norm that the local governments build the roads and the auto companies and the public drive on the roads. And nobody ever talks to each other. Uh, Johan uh, from Ford uh, said at the opening of the IATL, he said, uh, up until now, we've been used to an environment where the only contact between a car and the road and the infrastructure was through the rubber of the wheels. That was the only interface. And that's a comparatively simple interface that has got you know, very little technology in it. But now we're into the business where the car is going to talk to the, uh, to the infrastructure. So it has to be able to talk a language that everybody understands, the car companies and the infrastructure understands, and all the different car manufacturers. And so uh, everybody's got together in a organization called the 5GAA. I've touched on it before the 5G Automotive Association. And this is a, a trade association or a volunteer private sector organization uh, where 135 companies approximately now have got together and said, let's deliver on this future. Not, and we, as Applied Information and the ITL, are, are part of that organization. Uh, it's an international organization. We meet four times around the world, uh, including uh, COVID-19 willing, in Atlanta uh, for the next North America meeting to, for, for, the, for the whole world to come and see all of this technology we've stood up here in action. But the point being is that all the car companies are members of this organization and they're finding out about the infrastructure and about traffic cabinets and about um, how traffic lights work and flashing yellow arrows and um, unprotected left turns and, and so forth as we speak and that that's going to be uh, an emerging market for companies like ourselves, technology companies, application engineering companies, consulting companies, and everybody to deliver these applications into the cars. Because something that we would take for granted is how the traffic intersections work and how the, the pedestrian signals are timed with the traffic uh, intersection, whether there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. Auto companies, that hasn't been front and center of their world until now. So it's a huge opportunity to collaborate. I believe that that's the uh, uh, collaborating on a series of small imperfect standards is how we built the internet, it's how we built this, the cell phone network, and it's how we're going to build 
infrastructure. We've all got our part to play. There's nobody in charge. The auto companies, the infrastructure companies, the technology companies, the radio companies, the antenna companies, the application companies, the consulting companies, they've all got their part to play. And uh, this fertile ground over the next couple of years to actually get this out of the science experiment and into the real world. So you said the 5G Automobile Association, and, and as far as I understand that, there's you know, a huge number of companies that are involved with that, you know, including all the car companies, infrastructure companies, telecommunication companies, and even Google and Apple and Samsung and you know all of the other the other people because yeah, so, yeah. so so there's 130 odd members of of the organization, and I mean, how's that driving this through and driving it at a faster rate now that for the first time you have all of these companies trying to push through this technology instead of just one technology going through and dragging everyone along. Uh, again, it's, I'll give you the, 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 the summary version. Uh, and it goes to the, the, the issue of business cases. It goes to the issue of Iridium as a satellite company versus AT&T as first a landline company and now a media company. How did these big changes happen? And they happened because the market demanded use cases that came from business. And a, the, the history has just shown us that a government mandated radio just wasn't a compelling enough case for everybody to voluntarily get behind it. So what's happened is, uh, and then in the early stages of the mobile network operators, mobile network operators is the name for cell phone companies. Um, some people passed, survived, and some people failed. And I, I referred to Nextel, who ended up being bought by Sprint. Uh, and uh, the, the, that was their, their technology was eventually sunsetted and, and, and made obsolete. Um, but these are the forces that exist in the market. And so, what we see is um, another standards body called the 3GPP uh, writing standards for cell phones. And in the beginning, there were a number of competing standards, but the LTE standards have essentially won out on other standards that everybody adopts. And so they're busy writing right now as we speak, the standards for 5G. And 5G are the next generation of applications of um, the remote, surgery through to high speed videos, through to centimeter level accurate maps, through to all kinds of applications which folks are, are, are deploying either in the device or at the edge of the cloud or in the cloud and so forth. So this is what the, the, the billions of dollars are being spent on. And so uh, what came about is the 5G AA, just a matter of two or three years ago, uh, came to the conclusion is that a new radio standard for which is called CV2X Direct, or PC5 more, more precisely and more complicatedly, but this is the direct line of sight radio, could be made part of 5G in the future. And what it would do, it would provide a really solid migration path from uh, 4G, from line of sight radios through to 5G. Now, as I've explained before, we adopt all the radios, so we don't have a radio preference of one radio versus the other, except for the business case of the Ford Motor Company. They announced at SES uh, last year, CES last year, uh, that uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, that they were going all in on cellular V2X Direct and equipping cars from 2022 uh, with this technology and advocating to the FCC to give them spectrum, them and the other automakers and the 5GAA, so that these cellular V2X Direct devices could legally operate in the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum. Um, that led to all kinds of squabbles, fights, and 
bureaucracy, but led us to the position where in the next couple of months, there's, the FCC have told us they're advocating for a position where they will grant for the spectrum that, and the 5GA, the spectrum that they seek, and that um, uh, this is all then going to become a reality. So that's the march towards the future. Uh, on the infrastructure side, we're advocates for supporting all the radios or at least having technology that's upgradable from one to the other, that's got a clear path of how we're going to deploy 5G radios as they become available uh, and, um, and, and accommodate these, these standards which are, which are finalized and being finalized by the infrastructure guys. Um, and so uh, that describes a future where the 5GA has brought its cell phone operators, the car companies, the technology guys into a world where everybody can be get behind a common business idea. The common business idea is to get this deployed as opposed to arguing about the radios. So you talked about um, FCC and I always hear all these you know, comments coming back from FCC and everybody goes, well, we've got to be careful about what we deploy right now because we don't know what the FCC is going to rule. And I don't, and maybe you want to just take us through, read, not in any detail, because I know that'll be an hour-long conversation. Give everybody a nosebleed about but, this. But just, you know, and why our model of providing all the radios has actually just provided that flexibility on our side. So just explain a bit what's going on in the FCC. Yes, let, let me do that. And so what I'm, again, going to explain this in the context of not us pushing a particular product or approach, but us looking to skate towards where the pack is going to be. Now, these are forces that are in place in the in the infrastructure in the in the in the world that 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 are not up to us. These are the the commercial forces of of wireless radio being the last mile communication of choice. So I'm going to explain the FCC like this. The FCC is the Federal Communications Commission, and what they are is the organisations charged with regulating the nation's airways. Who gets to do what? in what frequency. Now, each of these frequency bands are called spectrum. It's called spectrum allocation. And a number of years ago, in the late 90s, the spectrum was allocated for automobile safety. Now, at that time, there was only one standard in, in, in one game in town called DSRC. The details are unimportant, but it's a, it's a Wi-Fi standard that Good, bad, or indifferent doesn't really matter. I'm not going to debate the merits of the standards or the merits of these technologies, because again, I might have an opinion, but my opinion doesn't count. And the reason why my opinion doesn't count, it's not what applied information or the IATL do, it's what the Ford Motor Company does. It's what BMW do, what Audi do, and so forth. In the first team, it's, a, it's um, what Qualcomm, as a technology provider, at what AT&T, as a mobile network router, Verizon, or T-Mobile. It's what they do that counts. And they've all solidly got behind cellular V2X, both cellular V2X direct, as well as uh, cellular V2X uh, network. Now, what the NFCC has done is they've heard industry and these players, these multi-billion dollar players, loud and clear to say they want to move in this road down here. We're dealing with the reality that uh, one car company and one uh, and a number of the uh, state, particularly the states, uh, want to say, no, 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 we want the radios that we've invested in and we've deployed and we've spent the last decade getting comfortable with, we want to preserve our investment in those. And that's the DSRC um, part of, the, of, of this need for spectrum. And so what the FCC did, um, actually with a certain amount of wisdom, they said, okay, well, what we're going to do is give some spectrum to cellular video X and some spectrum to DSRC. And we'll let the market win out in the future. So 
we as a matter of public record, if you want to see what applied information, think about all of this. Uh, our, our comments to the FCC are public. We support that approach. We support preserving the whole spectrum for all these new applications, which we and others are inventing a, as we speak. But nonetheless, we're going to be faced with the business of deploying this life-saving technology with the spectrum that we get allocated, not the spectrum that we wish we'd been allocated. So again, there are two, two, two folks. Uh, uh, to, if you're an early adopter city who wants to uh, deploy connected vehicles to start delivering day one applications to get ready for Ford, to have an infrastructure that's ready uh, for the future, whether it be DSRC, cellular VTX Direct, or 5G NR in the future. What we did is we said, we think that's where the puck is going to be. And we uh, developed our technology to support that open architecture. We can support all these radios in the future. And yet still like competitively with uh, single use radios. But if you're a, a, a city who believes very strongly in, 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 in the, the future is fixed and it's not subject to change and you want to make a commitment to everything being fixed today, then buy the radio of your choice. And we're probably not the right company to deal with because um, we find it just difficult. Uh, we support all the radios, but we, we, we sort of don't really go down the road of the future being fixed as opposed to the future is flexible. And all our smartphones and our vulnerable road users and our pedestrians and our cyclists um, and our freight vehicles and and everybody's got a role to play in the future and and we see the fact that um, there are 200 million smartphones in vehicles right now how are we going to leverage that that's the discussion we're going to have is that uh, one just one of the mobile network operators has put 40 million cell phones inside motor cars right now how are we going to leverage that to avoid it hitting pedestrians that's the topic not which radio you want so you talk about you know the, the the 200 million smartphones and i remember a great story um about when you were traveling somewhere and you, we saw what was happening in the connected vehicle you saw what was happening in the connected vehicle world and just decided to uh develop the um Travel safety app. Now, can you just walk us through um, walk us through what happened there? Um, talk to you just there's some other folks coming into the lab. They're welcome to get crash our, our party here. Um, but uh, okay, so what what uh, what happened is this. Um, there've been a lot of you know for the last decade or more. There's been a discussion about equipping the uh, infrastructure with connected vehicle technology and the radios and so forth and the standards. And, and it, it always fell, fell down on the, on the business case of, well, what happens to your 57 Chevy that doesn't have connected vehicles? How's, how's that going to work? How are we, we going to bring along all these cars that are already on the road? And uh, how are we going to retrofit them with connected vehicle technology. Well, you know, there was some organizations say, well, we're going to have a retrofit market and everybody say, but he has to pay $1,000 or $100 or $500, whatever the case may be, uh, to retrofit their, their vehicles. Because at that stage, everybody was focused that there was only one radio technology and you either use that or you were out of luck. And so as smartphones became, and this was about three years ago, uh, smartphones, you know, capability was increasing and increasing. I happened to actually be on safari in the, the banks of the Zambezi River, uh, thinking about all of this with my mind clear, trying not to be chased by a hippopotamus or eaten by a crocodile, which is another story. Um, but uh, there's not, by the way, if you want to get your heart going, there's nothing like canoeing on the Zambezi River amongst the hippos to, uh, to make you appreciate life. But nonetheless, we, I came across the idea that actually we just needed to do this because the time was done with uh, with um, with people 
buying into applications and technologies that just weren't uh, weren't demonstrable. In other words, if I could give you a demonstration of a technology and I told you trust me as opposed to seeing it, nobody, nobody, nobody would buy it, nobody would see it. So what we did is we said, all right, let's develop the technology called Travel Safety and use the radios that we have instead of the radios that we wish we had. And so that's brought us to use the cell phone radios, which are everywhere. Yes, and there might be a couple of places in uh, in, in the middle of nowhere where the radios uh, don't, don't work very well and, and, and other radios might be appropriate. But the point being is that in every city and of the 320 million Americans, probably 315 million of them have actually radios that work just fine. And so that's when we develop travel safely as a what we call a bridging technology. And it's a bridging technology um, which um, allows us to demonstrate applications that are only going to work better as new radios come around. So this is not instead of new radios. This is going to work better as, the tech, as these applications are built into the car, as they're built, should they apply the brakes, uh, should freight vehicles get, maybe it should be built into the vehicle, maybe it shouldn't. But it allows us to use the radios we already have, 200 million of them, versus the radios that we wish we had. And we're getting latencies of approximately you know, 200 to 300 milliseconds and so forth for the technical folks. They actually work fine for, for all the applications, especially now that the newer cars are using automatic emergency braking with, with local sensors. But, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's an exciting time because when we can, everybody deploying applications, and we, for example, we talked about should freight vehicles um, get priority green lights. We say, well, let's see how that works in practice. So we develop a, the, the, the application to say Travel Safely Pro now not only shows you that the lights are green, but it actually turns the lights green uh, from your smartphone. Now, whether a city wants to do that or doesn't want to do that, or whether it should be told, that moves the discussion away from the radios into the applications, which we think is important. But on the same side, it also, you know, using a smartphone allows you to connect to cyclists and pedestrians, which is probably the biggest increase in uh, road accidents has been, you know, over the last 10 years, it's, it's the number one increase. If you have a look at car fatalities, they've actually been decreasing per mile travel. But the increase in pedestrians and cyclists has, has skyrocketed. Correct. And that's again to go to the philosophical question about what's our role as a technology company in society. And we've believed that we've got a role to develop technologies to save those lives, to save the lives of those pedestrians. And how are we going to do that in practice? We're going to wait a long time before every pedestrian is carrying a radio other than the radios that they currently carry. We've got to wait a long time before every car carries a radio other than the radios it currently carries. So let's, let's not let perfection get in the way of doing something now. And, and, and in fact, there's, the, there's a, um, a, uh, a, a, a number of cities have uh, what they call Vision Zero which is in 2030 or in 2050, let's have zero fatalities. Well, in some circles, that's a great vision and it's very aspirational, but in some circles, it means we don't have to do anything until 2029 because we're not establishing intermediate milestones. We say we much uh, prefer a vision 50 or some terminology like that. Well, that's in the next five years, decrease the number of accidents by 50%. Then we're gaining on the problem. And we can do that with the radios we have, not the radios we wish we have. Now, I'm not trying to convince everybody, anybody not to do the other radios as well. I mean, Ford is, is doing the, the other radios and for a variety of reasons, uh, for, for short range safety, they think that's the right radio. And I fully support that. But the fact that Ford thinks that that's the radio we should use, well, it's like being chased by hippopotamus. At that time, you just don't have an opinion. You just go in the same direction as that the, that the hippo is running, and, and so so that's what what we're doing. And um, 
But nonetheless, we're looking at a number of the mobile network operators delivering applications to broadcast, for example. That technology is available now. We can deliver applications uh, to say that an emergency vehicle is on its way. Uh, be careful in this area, there's an emergency vehicle with an active run with technologies that the cell phones have today. Mm -hmm. And let's not let striving for the perfect get in the way of what's achievable today. Um, and so, uh, so I think that that's, that, that's how we, we see the vulnerable road users. I mean, I, they're all types of things. I'll just I'll close with one last but important point. It's equally important that the pedestrian gets, knows it's going to be hit by a car as it is for the car to know that it's going to hit a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. Just one or the other only gives you half the story. And that's where this, these radios that we have and the smartphones and the, and the edge computing and so forth, uh, virtualization, uh, remote broadcast, the very various technologies, uh, all of which we can be explained in detail, are how the future is going to work so that when you're in a pedestrian crossing, even if you don't have a smartphone, the fact that you're in that crossing is going to be broadcast to all the vehicles that are approaching that crossing. So then the car won't hit you, even if you're indigent and you don't have a, 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 a smartphone. That's the technologies available now in the immediate future to do that, to deliver a better future. I want to change tax just a little bit because, sure. um, you know, it, we talk about all of this and, and it sounds wonderful. But it sounds like something that only a giant city like Atlanta can afford. Um, you know, is it possible for small cities to go out and deploy this kind of technology? Absolutely. And it's quite interesting that either even Atlanta being a big city, actually Atlanta isn't a big city. Atlanta is actually made up, the Atlanta metro area is made up of 70 cities, all needing to deliver services for their citizens, their cities, their counties, their states, their metropolitan planning organizations, there's groups of cities, uh, there's uh, CIDs, uh, community improvement districts, uh, private sector taxpayer funded precincts in Atlanta. And into this fabric, uh, one needs to deploy connected vehicles. And so some cities are doing this on a grand scale, some are doing it on a medium scale, and some are doing it on a really small scale. And these technologies, for example, uh, give a shout out to Cullman, Alabama, which uh, North Alabama town, uh, which is delivering uh, application of getting paramedics to citizens in need and alerting uh, with travel safely, the public that an emergency vehicle is behind them or in front of them on the right or the left, and started off with 10 intersections, and each year they add another 10 as budget becomes available to expand their cities based on delivering real value to real uh, to their citizens on the first day, those day one applications. And so um, uh, we, we've got situations of medium-sized cities, maybe Marietta, Georgia, uh, where they equip their infrastructure and then the local bus company, which is Coblink, outfitted their buses to be able to make the buses get through bottlenecks more quickly and more effectively. Uh, and so the connected vehicle applications have built on each other. Uh, they do have a lot of uh, high accident areas and slow speed zones and uh, school beacons and so forth, all of which they've brought into this connected vehicle world. Um, as budget uh, allowed. And so from the smallest uh, town to the largest town, this technology is scalable. And I make the point, maintainable, because connected vehicles have to be designed, built, operated, and maintained without overloading the infrastructure the organizational infrastructure of this small city. And I, and I, and I give you a case in point uh, right now, is um, that that's where our technologies and our future, the puck where we're skating towards, 
we always said that, that folks need to, to operate their equipment and be able to detect failures from home. Now, who would have known that when we designed all of this, we'd be dealing with a situation where all our cities, uh, I spoke to Josh Rowan, the commissioner of Atlanta, and where they, uh, they stood down their work from home, have to work from uh, the office at 10 o'clock and by two o'clock in the afternoon, all the employees in the, in the traffic department were working from home. And so this is where all these technologies of, of operating and maintaining the system need to work for, over a browser, need to work on an iPad, need to work on your phone, um, so that you can work from home in situations like, like we experienced today with COVID-19. Uh, when a city is deploying this kind of technology, what kind of infrastructure do they need? In other words, to deploy this kind of this kind of technology, can can a small city who just has a couple of intersect, you know, has 20 intersections out there, deploy this, or do they need to spend millions of dollars on a consultant designing, you know, a whole bunch of different things and putting in fiber plans and and all the rest? And the answer is no. And the reason being is that our world has changed in the last few years with the advent of high-speed local wireless service. Now, we didn't invent this. We just use what Steve Jobs and various other very clever people did uh, to make it possible to stream video and deliver what we call wireless fiber. And so what it is, is that this wireless fiber uh, is um, a way of, of, of not putting fiber optic in for your last mile, but using the services that are available commercially, which we can price and which we provide 10 year service, mm -hmm. including warranty and maintenance. So it's like you've got a, a fiber uh, installed, but it's all it just comes as part of the equipment. Can we also work over fiber as well? I mean, can oh, yeah. the equipment use the fiber that a city's already invested in? Whether the whether the bits and bytes run over a fiber or whether they run over the air, it's all the same. And you're seeing that on your computers that you can't really tell whether your computer's connected over Wi-Fi. I mean, the folks on this on this video webinar wouldn't know whether the uh, uh, whether this was running over wireless Wi-Fi cell or fiber or ethernet or 100 megabit ethernet or gigabit ethernet it's all the same just i believe somebody's got a question for us yeah we have some questions here um so the first question is will the ai cv dsrc uh, roadside units work with non-ai dsrc radios same for any other suppliers working to deploy cv2x solutions and the answer is absolutely we warrant it so we warrant that in two ways, is we warrant conformance with the standard. And in fact, as we walked around the lab, you saw two different brands of OBUs talking to the infrastructure uh, here in Alpharetta. So no, you don't need to buy our radios, point number one. Point number two is that we will warrant that it will work with Ford. And as you know, these security changes get made, we don't need to involve you in that. So let's say in six months' time, when the whole security credentialing changes, we'll just take care of that because we provide a managed service. And so that's what our end-to-end -end warranty is about, is that we just warrant that they'll work together. Awesome. Okay. And this is a great area to test it, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And it was obviously about the confidence because of what's behind us. Great. Um, so our next question says, what are your thoughts on the collection, distribution, and use of the data generated and collected by Glance and other connected vehicle systems for big data anal analytics, feature application development, et cetera? Okay, that's a, good, that's a great point. Um, and applied information uh, has a simple view, and it goes like this. We have no intentions or aspirations to monetize the data. We're an infrastructure technology company. Now, what does that mean? And the question is, who is the data owned by? Well, 
as it happens, that's another 30 minute seminar on intellectual property rights of data, which is a fact and so cannot be protected. Derived works can be protected, but that takes you into a slightly more complicated. The practicality is we go to market exclusively through distribution and channel partners. So our relationship with the city is through our distributor. We have a relationship with the, with the distributor, they have a relationship with the city. We respect that and so we don't we provide the data to at no charge to whoever the city and the distributor tell us to make it to available. Does, does, I think that that answers and, the and, question. And that allows us to send the real-time connected vehicle data to another company that wants to do big data on, on all of this information. So we absolutely, the, the question, we absolutely do support. We don't have any vision on ourselves of doing big data. We know what we're good at. We're really good at doing the infrastructure side and we'll provide that real-time data feed to, to whoever uh, the city allows us to. Awesome. And then lastly, you spoke to this a little bit earlier, Brian, but do you, it says, do you currently have an app for pedestrians and bicyclists to use? Yes. And, and if you just go to the app store and you download Travel Safely, uh, you'll see um, th that uh, there's a section for pedestrians and there's pedestrians for, for cyclists. So while you uh, walking around, the phone will use an algorithm to to detect that you're a pedestrian. In other words, you're moving, but you're not moving very fast. Uh, and then it will broadcast that signal to uh, the vehicles in your vicinity. And so uh, this is our contribution to the vulnerable road users as a technology demonstrator. Uh, you know, we don't see that we're going to ever monetize that. We're an infrastructure technology company, but travel safety supports pedestrians and uh, and cyclists as we speak. And then, including as it happens, uh, new things that we do. A number of the video uh, detection cameras uh, support uh, de detecting the pedestrian in crosswalks, and so we actually provide that to the car when there's a pedestrian, even if the pedestrian doesn't have that we alert the car that there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk um, through, the, through the Travel Safety app. So we've got quite a lot of pedestrian support in, the, in Travel Safety. And much the same way for pedestrians and school zones, which is another, it's another type of warning when you, know, you have a high concentration of pedestrians in an area like a school zone, that we warn the vehicles that they're entering into a dangerous area where there's a potential that children are going to be running around. So th there's a lot of these applications already looking at, you know, reducing the number of accidents with pedestrians. Correct. And that, and that that's all part of delivering the promise of connected vehicles, not at some esoteric way of presenting at some kind of uh, a technical conference. But let's get this out in the street and let's see this working in practice and uh, one of the things we've done, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a place in the Travel Safety app, for example, where you can report bugs and you can report feature requests and we've had a number of interesting features requested mm -hmm. by, by public using the Travel Safety app and uh, that provided great input as far as user need, practical user need to us as technology guys. Great. Well, that answers all of our questions. Well, appreciate it. I think we are perfect on time here. It's 3.58. We've got two minutes to spare. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that has uh, joined us today. Um, there will be a follow-up email that Jessica is going to send out with uh, some of the content, some handouts. And um, you, you'll probably receive some other emails with some of the upcoming sessions that we have. We've got a session with uh, Chief Jackie Gibbs on Thursday um, afternoon as well. At what time is that, Jessica? It's at 1 p.m. Eastern. 1 p.m. Eastern. So, and also, you know, feel free to look through any of the other webinars that we've done. I hope we can get Brian here again uh, to come pick his brain on some of this technology. So, um, thank you so much, Brian, for joining us. Yeah, th th thanks so much, everybody. It's been a real privilege to spend some time with you all and 
and, and spent some time talking about our passion of connected vehicles and uh, how the future looks different to the past. I'm looking forward to a, a bright and exciting future. And please reach out to any of us and any of our distributors if you want to know any more information. And uh, thank you so much for being here.